right. So I I I think I'm Brent Leary. Uh, I am probably not Paul Greenberg, but <laughs> a substitute adequately. I hope. So this is we think another CRM players episode. How we, we need like a an applause track. No, we, yeah, yeah, we can be our own. Yay! <laughs> oh, all right. So it's been. Uh, did we do one? We didn't even do one at Dreamforce, did we? No, yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, we did it we... with uh, with uh, Tom Brennan. Yeah, that was fun. That, that was, was a, fun. That was a good uh, one. Yeah, I, I, that's I got one we did too, though, right? What was that? That was the last one we did, I think. Yeah, that's right. And I still remember his stories about Woodstock. So this is really cool. <laughs> oh, well. All right. So it's been uh, a little over a month. It's it's hard to believe it's been that long since Dreamforce. But... I know. I know. I, you know what? I Actually, this was a little strange. So I got a Facebook reminder yesterday. Of, you know how you friended so-and-so how many years ago? So it's for Brian Solis, and it said, I, I actually didn't even believe this, it said nine years ago. Nine. On Facebook, nine years ago. That means I didn't realize I knew him that long. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I actually thought I met him in 2012 or 11 or 10, maybe. <laughs> See, this is about right. This is 2018. That's, oh, that's the rough thing. <laughs> do you remember where you guys met? I remember how we met, actually. Um, I had been told forever, you need to talk to this guy, Brian Solis. And I knew who he was, obviously, because he was still, you know, transforming. He just finished, in effect, transforming PR to what it is today, which is, you know, with the, with the kind of the social aspects. And he was, he was like the guy who changed the industry. So I knew who he was and I knew people who knew him, obviously. So, cause we both do. And, um, and apparently he had been told he needs to talk to me. So we finally somehow, I don't remember how we exactly managed, but it was probably on LinkedIn or something. But um, we decided to talk and we set up 30 minutes to talk and talk three hours. <laughs> but that's not surprising <laughs> with you. <laughs> it was just like instant, it was instant, <laughs> an instant bond, man. We had it right away. And ever since then, of course, we've been very close and I just, I love the guy. I really do. He's big heart. He's a great guy. Yes, he is. He truly is. All right. So uh, we got a couple of things we wanted to talk about. Um, we got to we got to talk about you know the announcement that just came out, official announcement uh, at some point about Amazon and their HQ two uh, thingy. Um, yep. We were going to talk about. I know the big thing we're going to talk about is the SAP thing. Was there anything else we're going to talk about? We can talk about the fact that Giants finally won the second game. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that for you to talk about. Well, uh, <laughs> only seven to go to run the table. <laughs> OBJ said we're going to run the table. Seven to go. <laughs> and, and he also said he's going to drink more water, which I think yeah, was yeah. the best. <laughs> this is actually a cute kind of. It was. He's, it was like he's trying to get more sleep and he's trying to get more water. You know. <laughs> He was trying so hard to be a grown up in that. I know it came off like a little kid, but it was fun, a fun little kid. And you realize he's sincere and trying. That was the other yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, that's true. You could see yeah. he was really trying. I know, and good for him. He and he even admitted. He said, "Look, I know at times I've, I I didn't use the word regressed, but it was the equivalent of right. yeah. But, right. but you know, I'm really trying hard, is what he's saying. And good for him. <laughs> good for him. Yeah, I think that's cool. That makes you really want to see him do as well as he could. Yeah. Um, all right, so I guess the big news of the week, uh, outside of the Amazon HQ stuff, is, uh, you know, it, it seems like SAP always announces their acquisitions, like, on a Sunday night or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, is that is that because it's Monday morning in Germany, probably? It probably is. I, I guess that may be. That's probably true. Yeah, what? so, I mean, so, yeah, Sunday night, I got my little notification, and I, I got it on my, my new... Apple Watch Four. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's the bigger, bigger. Uh, yeah, it's the forty-four uh, uh, centimeter di diameter, or whatever they call it. I don't know. That's yeah, a nice thing. Really, it's got a nice screen. I could actually watch a movie or something on here. Anyway, but, 
Um, so I uh, got the notification that SAP had acquired Qualtrics for eight billion dollars. All right. So, what was your first thought when you heard the news? Give me a billion. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I mean, I'm a. I was look. Overall, SAP does a good job in terms of their acquisitions, and it's done a particularly good job over the last few years with their customer-facing ones, in particular, you know, like uh, Calus Cloud and, and Giga and so on. And they, they've really done well with them, and they're thoughtful acquisitions. They tend to have a good reason behind them. I thought this was valuable. Uh, you know, they didn't have either. <laughs> I'm simplifying it a little bit here, but they didn't have either a survey tool, which is only one aspect, but more important for Qualtrics is the analytics are really strong behind it, behind it. And they didn't have, they're calling them experience analytics. I'm not, I'm calling them engagement analytics, but the reality is they didn't have those kind of customer focused analytics as part of their analytics platform. So this becomes immensely valuable for them on that level. Now, the thing is, as far as the price goes, I don't care. You look, you know what? I, I, we have all these financial analysts sitting there and measuring against uh, EBITDA and I don't know, whatever. They're measuring against <laughs> financial terms I barely understand. Um, but the reality is this. SAP was willing to pay it and Qualtrics was willing to take it. Okay, so who am I to judge them? <laughs> somebody <laughs> offered, somebody took. Okay, I had nothing to say about it. So <laughs> good for Qualtrics to get eight billion, and good for SAP that they got what they wanted for eight billion. Um, now that said, uh, you know they're trying to call it transformational and earth shaking, and this is going to change the nature of the market, and we're going to become the market. It's not. It's it's uh, it's good. It's positive. It fills a significant spot in a, a hole in their ecosystem, which will benefit them a great deal, you know, as did, if, if in fact, if I was picking important acquisitions, I would put this behind Calidus Cloud in its importance. I mean, you know, Calidus Cloud, to me, was, of all the customer-facing ones, the most significant one they did. That's the one that's making them really, truly competitive. Um, but it's still useful. Now, that said, there's you know, when Salesforce acquired Exact Target, the hidden gem there, or the gem there wasn't Exact Target, it was Pardot. Right. Well, these guys acquired Qualtrics. The gem there isn't Qualtrics, it's Bruce Temkin. <laughs> <laughs> acquired Bruce the Temkin Group with Qualtrics, who had acquired the Temkin Group like, um, like, what was it, a month before or less, three weeks before that. So they got the best customer experience, strategist, analyst, influencer, thought leader in the industry, right? Bar none, really. I mean, he's the best. And and um, and that's a hidden gem, just like a part of, you know, the part of the product and Bruce is a human, but uh, <laughs> you know, but that's really, that's a, as much as, I don't know if you want to acquire a person for $8 billion, but, uh, you know, but you get the point. I mean, this is, so, there are some really good aspects to this acquisition, but it's not transformational. Look, it takes so much more than acquiring tech and for transformation to come at a level that leads you into the marketplace. Look, to be honest, given that Salesforce is the obvious target of everybody in this, so what they're Salesforce the, has, They're the exact target, huh? <laughs> right? I'm trying to think of something with par and dot, but it doesn't <laughs> Right. But you know what? You know what? I'll tell you. Look, uh, and then I want to get your thoughts on this. But here's the thing. The power of Salesforce has never been in the amount of tech it provides. It's been in the company that they are and how they present themselves to the market and how the market adopts and accepts them. Right. And the, their externalization, their culture has been the critical factor of difference. When somebody says not, I want to buy your technology because I love your technology because there are plenty of. <laughs> Technologies that do compete with Salesforce just fine yeah. and will beat them just as much as not. But what they've got is that when somebody gets involved with Salesforce, say, I want to be part of that, right? I want to be part of that. And that's, that's transformational because the company becomes, as Benioff actually has publicly said, uh, um, 
a, a, a force for change. You know, the, the company itself becomes a force for change. And that's where he's aimed at, and that's how it's worked out well. You know, Qualtrics is an acquisition by a company that's on the rise that I'm still very cautiously still optimistic about, but have, I've never ever, I don't, they don't, they haven't made what I would call a bad acquisition for a long time. SAP's done really well with this, and, and Qualtrics is a good acquisition. It's just not, you know, an acquisition that's changing everything. It's just not that kind of thing. It's a, a survey tool with powerful analytics. Um, again, oversimplifying it, right. but it is just that. And so good for SAP. Yes, congratulations. And yes, this will fill a hole. And yes, this is going to improve your capabilities to, you know, fight it out in the marketplace and at the same time be a better, uh, you know, fill out your ecosystem in a better way. But it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't check every box you need to be truly trans, transformational. So what, what about you were thinking on it? So I was watching yesterday. It was, uh, I think it was on CNBC. They're interviewing Bill McDermott. And what's the guy, uh, the founder CEO for Qualtrics? Oh, uh, I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name. Yeah. I think Ryan something. Yeah. Maybe? Ryan something or something Ryan. Yeah. Some, there's a Ryan in there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Bill McDermott was like jazz. He was excited. He was, you know, all this stuff. But, he, you could tell he got a little, I don't know if offended isn't the, is the right word, but he was a little taken aback when uh, the CNBC guy, I think it was Andrew Ross Sorkin, he asked, he asked Bill, had he ever, did, well, you got Qualtrics, but did, had you ever thought about buying uh, SurveyMonkey? You know, they do the same things. And it was like, <laughs> uh, well, first of all, no, they don't exactly do the same thing. That's true, actually. And I've seen a lot, it's, it's absolutely true. And I've seen a lot of people saying, well, you know, and you, like you, I'm not a financial analyst. So I don't care what, uh, you know, business insider thinks. <laughs> not, um, but uh, I heard a lot of people saying, well, why didn't they just buy SurveyMonkey instead of spending $8 billion for it? I was like, well, I mean, that's apples and oranges there, really. Yes. Um, so let's get that out of the way. But... I'm like you. Uh, when I think of transformational, or I think of game changer, um, on its own, I don't see it as that. I, I think, like you said, SAP has made a lot of really good acquisitions over the last couple of years, and they're all like pieces to the puzzle. But I don't think the puzzle's complete yet, and I think I think it's a good, good, necessary piece. And when you think about, like you said, they, they have the analytic, analytical piece to go with the, you know, the survey piece. And that adds a certain kind of data to the operational data that you know, SAP has in space. So this adds another you know, kind of data and a, a way to analyze it. But I think the thing that maybe still is something they have to, to figure on, and particularly when you're looking at Salesforce and Adobe, I'll put Adobe in there too, from a marketing and experience cloud is particularly Adobe. They not only do they have the tools to analyze the data, but they have the tools to do something, you know, create the content, create the experiences that leverage the data in real time fashion more so than what I see right now, what SAP has with the Qualtrics edition. I think, and especially when you talk to a B2C perspective, I, I, like you said, B two B, Caldas really helps out, and and being able to, you know, bring this in with what Caldas has and what some of the other pieces. I think from a B two B perspective, that it really is a significant piece of the puzzle. But that other B two C, how do you take this data and create the experiences and leverage the data, uh, create the content? in real time and analyze it in real time. And, you know, I think there's still some work to be done on that. And so I think it's like you said, I think it's a good piece. Uh, do I see it on its own as transformational? No. Um, maybe if they get a couple other things in there and, and stitch them together the right way, maybe it is, but I, I don't see it as that as of today. Well, to your point, actually, in terms of creating 
what I've always called consumable experiences. Um, Adobe's the only one who really do that well. Salesforce doesn't do it either, really. Nobody does, other than Adobe. Uh, I mean, there are others who do it. I shouldn't say that, but uh, at the Adobe, scale of Adobe, yeah, right, so. he does it at that scale. And in fact, even Adobe didn't do it until you know fairly recently. They claimed it, but they didn't do it. Right. Um, I, that came, if I remember correctly, when um, they finally did the actual cloud integration. You know that they've been doing with Creative Cloud, and and they created. Uh, and they, remember when they showed? Uh, well, they showed this thing uh, where they. They integrated, uh, uh, I think it was Photoshop Sensei, which is their analytics platform and, um, AI platform rather. And, um, and, uh, experience manager. And essentially you could build experiences with that combination really quickly and effectively and build, oh, and also, uh, the marketing did the actual marketing piece too. And you could actually combine all of them to build out experiences and then campaigns around those experiences in almost no time. It was astonishing how good a actual converged piece that was. That, I think the whole industry beyond Adobe is pretty much missing. Uh, and as, as you rightfully point out, nece it's necessary. You know, you, it's great to know what the customer is thinking and doing, but then you have to act on it. I mean, uh, and you have to have a way of acting on it, right, too, as a business. So, and I think, you know, to your point, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in slightly different terms, but to your exact point, um, the, um, the Callus Cloud acquisition for SAP was more, made them, let's call it, operationally competitive. Right, they they added operational pieces, but they did. You're right. They didn't add the 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 sort of the creative pieces, the building pieces. Which, if you're going to be, if you truly are going to fight around customer experience, which again, I'm lukewarm on the idea of customer experience technology. You know, I I agree with it when Adobe thinks about it. When most other companies think the way they think about it, I don't agree with it because you can't enable how people feel about things. But um, with tech. So, but that said, uh, if you're truly going to build out a full bore, let's call it experience cloud, uh, you have to have the ability to create the consumable experiences. And, you know, only Adobe has it. The other side on transformation is you really do have to, it's a, it's a company issue, not a technology issue. Companies are what's transformative, not technology. Technology is a piece of transformation. I'm writing a very large piece right now, actually. It, it, Typically, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 well, right now it's relatively small. It's like 4,000 words. Yeah, um, that's, that's relatively small. Yeah. It's called the <laughs> Nation of Salesforce. And it's going to be a big deal piece for me anyway, because it's taking the thinking of doing unhumanization a little further than it has been. And I'm, and I'm looking into a lot of research while I'm doing the pieces. And I looked into the research around basically how people feel. And uh, actually in the accidental social CRM group, there was a reference by Graham Hill to an article on uh, how um, that pretty much even your cold calculations are driven by emotion, which is something I've always said. But there's now an article to prove that it was not just me spouting off emotionally, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, but the article basically was pointing out how everything, every decision you make is one way or the other driven by how you're feeling. Right. And I'm driven by your emotions. And I am a complete fan of that thinking. Now, that said, you know, the power of transformation comes when th that kind of actually aspect building transformation is a, you said something really interesting in the way it poses. Bill McDermott was really jazzed and excited, which is emotional. Right. And Bill McDermott has no problem being emotional about things. He's emotional about things all the time. Um, you know, but it's emotional. That's the point. <laughs> That's the actual point. He's excited about it. And again, I, I don't necessarily, I don't agree with him that being transformational. He's probably right to be somewhat offended about the equivalent, you know, oh, yeah, the, survey, the monkey. survey monkey thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that meant that the CNBC reporter is really not doing much homework. But, <laughs> um, but everything you have to make, that's part of your company. That's part of who you are. It's part of, when I used to call it a company like me, right? Uh, 
it's it's there's a, there was a literally a 65 page study done on a company like me. Uh, it wasn't called exactly that, but it was literally close to those words. 65 page academic study done by I can't remember the name of the people. For that matter, I can't remember where they, where they made it. They were in Southern California, I think. Um, but the two two people did a study on that, and they were finding on the, the different things that people do when they anthropomorphize, 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 I guess, the companies, right? And and you know they they how they attach their emotions and how they give them human companies human characteristics and things like that, and. Again, it goes to the point that if you're going to be transformative, you have to reach a level where people's emotions are being moved, are being yeah. changed. You can't do that with just technology. You can you do that with the actual interaction of the company, the purpose of the company, the actions of the company, the way people perceive the company, the way they the way they they choose to act in conjunction with that company, et cetera, et cetera. There's a million things. The article's going to outline a lot of it. And Salesforce did that at Dreamforce, which is oh, actually to to some extent, right, to a large extent, and they humanized themselves as, as a result. It was one of the most important. I thought it was the most important keynote Mark Benioff ever gave, and yeah. how and how they say, yeah. too, right, yeah. it's to push them to something else, right. Yeah. So yeah. that's how you transform, and that's the battle that SAP has to wage, Microsoft. Who's doing some great things? Microsoft just announced a nonprofit accelerator, right? Which is really a really, and I, I, I'm just digging in now, and I'm very excited about it. It really looks good, and it's again, it's one of those things which is, you know, it's not just technology. It's there's a bit of an incubator involved. There's a, there's social good involved. There's a number of other things involved, but they're basically designed to get some good done, to do some good, and to humanize the company, and at the same time, um, you know. Build out things that will benefit Microsoft because that's ultimately what they're all yeah. doing. Well, they're all still in business, even if if they're able to do good and do business. That's like a win-win. Why wouldn't you want to do that? And like I said, Salesforce. I mean, at Dreamforce, I, we were sitting right next to each other. The first ten, fifteen minutes of of uh, Mark Benioff's keynote, I was like, man, I feel like I'm in church, or I feel I, I thought the next step was. And I would like to announce my candidacy. 2020. <laughs> yeah. But people were right there with them. I mean, it was really a, a, a complete departure from his previous keynotes, at least that segment of it. But it was one that I think pretty much set the stage for the whole conference and made it uh, made the rest of the keynote in particular people – we're you know focus on everything he said after that because like you said he kind of captured their their attention early on and was able to transfer it from kind of his statements that had absolutely nothing to do with faith, uh, Salesforce but he was a actually able to take kind of the, the connection he made with the audience and then transition it back into the things that Salesforce was doing yeah. and and you know what I'll tell you one thing this was a small thing but I think was almost key to how that speech was so different than anything else. In the past, in every other keynote ever, aside from the product announcements, which, as I said, you know, were moved into their respective cloud keynotes, right. yeah. um, with the exception of philanthropy cloud, which was very wise, you know, and then uh, Einstein voice, right? But, um, but what he did in the past, we think about every other keynote we've ever attended, there's been a segment where he invites a chosen charity or, or non-profit, and he brings them up, and then he gets them to talk, and then everybody gives money to them from a, a mobile app, and we're all done. But it's just a segment of the discussion. There was none of that this time. This time, the whole discussion was Salesforce as a actual social a force for social good. Not, we are yeah. aligned with this force for social good. We are a force for social good, right? And, and that that aligns with his discussion on, uh, I think it was also CNBC, or it might have been, or who knows, could have been Bloomberg, could have been Reuters, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but why he bought Time Magazine, where he said, business is a force for change. And then somebody else asked him, are you going to run for office? He said, why? I don't need to run for office. <laughs> he said, 
business is a force for change, right? I mean, this is his and Salesforce's mantra, and he's getting people interested. It's why that's what you got to do. Now, to SAP's credit, even though they don't highlight this much, although they did a bit at uh, in Barcelona, um, if you go back in the past, when they would talk, they, they had one, they do social good. SAP does a lot, actually. And they, they tend more on, their focus is more on sustainability, I'd say, is if I had to pick something. So several years ago, they did a thing on carbon footprint reduction, and they had built an app around it, and it was a good one. I mean, there's nothing, this is good tech, and, and it would actually help reduce um, um, the carbon footprint, but the way they positioned it at the time was around uh, the benefit to your business for profitability and blah, 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 right? Stupid, right? <laughs> Stupid, right? Because that is not what anyone wants to hear. Then it's just another thing they're doing to be make money, right? So um, this time... They talked about their adherence to the 17 U.S. sustainability, uh, UN sustainability goals. And they put it in terms of actual social good, meaning they did a, mm. the right thing. And it's, for them, it, the irony is that's not just positioning. They do mean it. And I know that. And in fact, the other thing, the carbon footprint, even though they meant it, they just were awkward in the way they did it. And it came out completely wrong. This came out right. And so they're making progress in terms of thinking about it. But, they, you know, if they think that Qualtrics is the transformative point, they're missing the point. Yeah. Well, and I think maybe uh, maybe the first step into being transformational is what you're saying about Bill McDermott and his uh, enthusiasm and passion. Um, right now, it you know. I'm just taking it from what I saw. The enthusiasm, the enthusiasm and passion is for the deal and the potential that this deal has in terms of building out their platform, um, as opposed to what you talked about with Mark Benioff. It's not about, not just about the platform. It's about the ability to be a change agent uh, to look at. It's almost like. I hate to quote Jay Z or anything, but yeah, he, he had that, he had that that quote. I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man, and I think there's the emphasis on we're not a a a, a change agent, or what I'm trying to say is we're not we're not just about you know change from a business perspective. We're about change because we're a business that can help make that change happen. Right. And I think that maybe that's the first step of being transformational is seeing beyond, you know, here's here's what we can what we're looking to do down here from a technology standpoint and, and saying that's transformational. Now, maybe that will help you to become transformational if you're able to kind of take the big picture view and apply it and leverage your technology and your platform to do it. Um, but right now, like you said, I, I, you know, like I said, SAP has made a lot of great acquisitions. Um, tying it together and creating kind of a canvas that tells the story and 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 creates that opportunity to be viewed as a transformational is part of being transformational because you can't transform people if they don't see you as being an agent for transformation. And so I'm not saying that, that SAP's doomed to fail. I'm saying, I think maybe if, if they kind of listen to what you just said and say, you know, these are pieces to our puzzle. We're, we're constantly building on that and then showing it, not just through how the technology works, but how it impacts, you know, their customers, but how their customers are able to impact you know their customers beyond just uh, top and bottom line growth. I think that's really where you inspire people to be transformational. Well, I'll tell you to the credit of Alicia Tillman, who's SAP's global CMO. I know she's attempting to produce, according to what I've heard and seen, 
sort of the broader corporate narrative that you were just describing. And I, I just, I'll tell you, it's been years since I said to the credit of any global CMO at SAP, <laughs> Jonathan Becker was the last one I credited with anything. But, um, but to her credit, she actually is uh, attempting to produce the kind of bigger, broader narrative for the company, you know, and that that's something that they've miss, been missing for a long time. Uh, and uh, that, I hope, in part, gets answered with the narrative, with like what you're describing and what I'm describing gets answered with the narrative. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's important work for them. And, and they, look, they are making changes that are real, and there's no question about it. And I, I will retain what I said when they first made the change, which was, you know, at Sapphire this year officially, actually three years ago, but um, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm probably a little more optimistic than I was, not a lot, but a little bit more, um, now because I'm seeing some positive moves, but there's still the bigger, broader pieces of, let's call it corporate transformation, are still not there or baked. They're still not fully baked, nor are they publicly visible. And they need to be, even more importantly than fully baked, publicly visible, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's, I think, where the real transformation will come. You know what? I think, you know, we can kind of finish off on this one, but I think at a company, we talked about this, at, at a company like Salesforce, um, Mark Benioff is just omnipresent. He's he's there. He's, you you don't even know who their CMO is because you think of him as you know the guy that kind of sets the stage for everything. It's different for, from companies that don't have that kind of personality as their founder, CEO, chairman, um, and the CMO and the and the marketing function becomes even more important to creating the story and, and relaying that story through a number of different channels because you don't have the big channel up front that captures everybody's attention and, and really knows what to do once they capture the attention. So what you're saying about uh, SAP, I think you can say that for pretty much most every other big tech company because let's face it, that personality is really hard. It, it, it doesn't come around every day. Yeah. No, it's, it's unique. Look, the man has the ability to engage actual people at the level they are. And, and that, you know, meaning as human beings, right? So, and he tries to. And it did, look, does he succeed all the time? God, no. I mean, he fails often enough. Yeah. Uh, um, but he makes the effort, right? And, 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 and connects. Yeah. Again, Dreamforce, best connection he's ever done, and also the best planned thing that, look, Salesforce, is, you know, as uh, hum human and humane as they seem, are also incredibly uh, logical planners, right? And they, they spend so much time on the minutia of planning. I've been involved with some of that, and they don't, they're not really good at listening to you on that level, but... Uh, Right, uh, but that's that speech was not only let's say brilliant in its humanity, but was incredibly well orchestrated. Um, and I would say, I would say, it really was coming from him. It wasn't right. something that he was making up just because he thought it would work, <laughs> like this AirPod. Um, <laughs> which you but, thought would, <laughs> yeah. But I, I, yeah. You can you can look at his tweets and in, in the 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 tweets that you see him really laying into are things that aren't necessarily specifically about Salesforce. Well, a perfect example. This uh, proposition C okay. just got passed. He won it. He yeah. was the only tech billionaire, as they call them, who was <laughs> fighting on behalf of the homeless for Prop C, meaning because, you know, it's going to be a corporate taxes. And he said, we'll pay the taxes if it helps the homeless. He said, what about you, Jack Dorsey, you dorksy, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, 
you know, well, he is a dork. I, you know, for for I, he's not a good man. Let's. I don't. I don't like what I saw his his approach to it. Yeah, we we want to help the homeless too, just not this way, which is going to cost us something, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, but he Benioff, he was relentless. I watched. I followed the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. he was relentless oh, on. He was he was going back and forth. With and he, he was not. He took his gloves off, man. He said. <laughs> I'm, I know you guys have known you for years. It's our club, you know, billionaire club. But the reality is, you don't like me anymore. You don't like me anymore. I don't care. This is important, and we're going to fight for it. And the mayor was against it. I mean, you know, everyone was against this except him, and it passed. And you know, I was all right in there with him. I don't know what I could do. I don't live in California, but <laughs> uh, but I, I'll tell you what. That's exactly what I mean. The guy he stood up to Mike Pence when uh, oh, back yeah. uh, Indiana. Indiana. Man. I mean, Georgia. Yeah. I mean, the guy takes stands. Now, you know, I've heard grumblings on that issue from shareholders or customers who say, well, we don't want to take a stand. We, you know what? But that's a, that's a minority. And that's also not the future or the, even the present, really. The present demands something more out of companies than just good product services, consumable experiences and tools. You know, I mean, it demands act, it demands action. It demands Corporate social responsibility, if you want to call it that. It demands some sort of, of humanity from the company because, you know, you can get the products in 20 different, 20 different ways, 20 different iterations from 20 different companies. So you have to pick the one that you feel the most happy with. And it is that. I am happiest with this company because this company does all these things that are not necessarily just me buying the product, but are things that I believe in and, and want to see and and are uh, and potentially expecting of companies. And, yeah. and and Benioff's willing to you know put that. Now you know it's funny. Just to sort of set one thing straight. So you remember during Dreamforce, the uh, I think it was called Fight for the Future, that coalition of immigrant okay. advocacy groups was demonstrating against Salesforce with the ICE or the the uh, CB uh, the CBP uh, contract, right? Uh, and uh, and I mean, they did do one thing that was actually funny. I have to admit, um, they had this when they were demonstrating. They had this big wooden cage, and on it it said detention center, and underneath it it said powered by Salesforce. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't help myself. I thought that was pretty good theater, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now, if I'm operating from my heart, I'm going with these guys, right? I'm going with Fight for the Future. But yeah. you know what? If I'm operating with my experience and my knowledge and my thinking, my 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 history, you pick and choose your fights, okay? You don't fight with a company that's doing 98% social good. Right. Right. And you're picking on the quarter of a percent, which is conflicting. It's not even bad. It's like because the, the reality is, you know, there's a reason why uh, Microsoft or SAP or any of the other companies didn't jump all over Salesforce on this one because they all have contracts with government right. <laughs> that would be brought right into question and could easily. But there's a million companies that have a million contracts with government agencies. Government agencies are government agencies. They're not. Uh, then they're, they're not always political tools. And, and in this case, this is, look, CBP sucks right now because of the administration, but, but the contract isn't the thing that's impacting this, right? right. Don't take on the company that actually wants to support you, right? That yeah, wants yeah. to work with you. Take on the companies that don't. And it, it was just, it was a badly timed move finding a company doing social good. And I never, I mean, you know me. I'm a leftist, for God's sake. I never come out on the side of companies and corporate. <laughs> but in this case, I, I, I thought it was more for publicity than anything else. Yeah, and I mean, you can go on about what they're doing in, in the equality space. You can talk about what they do at Vent Force. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things. But not to just talk about them. Look, you know, there's companies like Zoho who who yeah. are doing things that a lot of people just don't know about. I mean, yeah. I love what... Sridhar, you know, when you get him talking about education and teaching and and why he set up Zoho University to, to help young people, you know, learn how to do engineering and, and build products. 
and give them an opportunity to make get a job after that without having a you know having the funds to go to college. They could go to Zoho University. Um, there's a lot of things that companies like Zoho is doing, and and like you said, there are things that Microsoft, Oracle is doing things. Yeah, they all they, need to be to actually bake those things into it, not make it a, a, a sideline. You know, if you want to, you know, go over here. The good thing, once again, going back to Salesforce, what they did great about it is they put it right in the main keynote, and it's not something that is a, a, a doesn't fit. Or they're just doing it, oh, this looks like an add-on. It is actually integrated into the overall story. Yeah. And and I think that's why, uh, you know, they are able to grab people's attention and keep it longer. And and other companies struggle with that. they got to well, figure out they, how to bring it all together. To your point, I mean, what they've done, and this is where I think every company needs to learn its lesson. And... and so what they, what Salesforce done, what Zoho's done, what Microsoft's done to some extent, what SAP is getting better at, Oracle is starting to show some signs, but the key is to take this social good and align it fully with your culture. It becomes a fully integrated part of your culture, meaning it's not alien. It's, so when it's alien, it's marketing, right? Yeah. And when it's, when it's aligned with your culture, it's real. And in the case of Salesforce, Zoho, again, Microsoft, some extent, SAP, improving and Oracle beginning. Um, it's really, it, it, it's, it's either real or becoming real with those companies. I would say if I had to pick the two that at least I'm most aware of, you know, in terms of true alignment, it would be Salesforce and Zoho. I mean, I think your point on Zoho is really well taken. You know, and I'll tell one story and then I'll be quiet about it. But uh, Sridhar and I had this conversation about two years ago at, when you p put together that analyst first analyst summit for them, and um, and uh, he was telling me about uh, how he's got this farm, and on this farm they're they're testing sustainability for twelve ancient grains, and the idea being not to fall. I don't know how much you read on the so called green revolution of Norman Borlaug and rice and so on but this years ago there was this thing where you could grow rice quickly and lots of it and it was going to you know solve hunger and blah 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 but the downside as it turned out is that it sucked all the nutrients out of the soil right so but when you did that so you couldn't regrow it in that same soil right so it was actually became problematic so he was he's aware of all of that and he's looking for something that is a sustainable grain, right, in that regard. And not only will it be abundant and, and, and nutritious, but also will retain the nutrients in the soil or, you know, keep the proper level so that you can replant and so on and so forth. And he was, he's testing 12 different ancient grains. And he said, I, I don't know the exact number. I said, I think he said two or three of them are showing some signs of promise. But just to give you a sense of how aligned it is with the culture, um, and again, some of this may be an apocryphal story, but he told me this, and this is my memory of it, so I might be enhancing it a little bit. I, I don't think I am, but I might be. Uh, he was telling me about how he was having this conversation with one of their top software development engineers, and she was, he asked her, you know, where, what, what your degree was in? And she said, agricultural science and microbiology or something like that. Wow. And he went, wow, how'd you become a developer? She said, well, I couldn't really get a job doing what I, Love, you know, what I went to school for, but you know, I became a developer. I, I liked it, and I turned out to have a real facility. I and mean, this is a very senior developer. He said, "Well, I have this farm. How would you like to stay on Zoho's payroll and at the same time run this farm for me?" And that I, again, maybe it's somewhat apocryphal. Maybe she, this is a couple of years ago. Maybe she left. I have no idea, but I do know the story, and that's. But that shows you how the culture works right this wasn't like oh well i would just tell this farm story because good marketing and that's a whole separate thing it has nothing to do with oh really just some thing no this is like integral to how they are as a company and all the work they're doing in india with education that you mentioned i mean they're they're an astonishing company they need of course and you and i have both told them this i'm sure a million times they need to talk about it more they actually do need to talk about it more yep sandy if you're listening <laughs> Right. <laughs> Come on, Sandy. All right. So we went real long on that. Just, all right. So any any uh, special thoughts on HQ2? 
Uh, well, Crystal City. That's uh, my uh, my wife's old work haunts, which she's long retired. Uh, was where the company used to be. Now they're in Alexandria, but um, it's a really it's it's an urban area. It's not it's not it's called Crystal City, and it looks like a city. It doesn't look like a suburb with that name, even though it's not in D.C. proper per se. Uh, maybe technically it is, but it's very much the outskirts near the Pentagon and, uh, and yeah. that whole area. And Pentagon City Mall is there, but it's got residences, you know, condos and uh, and apartments. It's got really high-end restaurants. There's Jose Andres restaurant or two there. It's got all the shopping you'd want. It's got highway access. It's got a metro stop. You know, and it's needed a bit of an uplift. Oh, it's also got a train stop too, an actual, you know, train stop there. Yeah, I used to ride, ride a, when I get on Reagan. When I was working in D.C., I'd get uh, the metro at Reagan and ride it all the way in. And of course, Crystal City is one of those stops, and a lot of people could get on and, and go into town. I think it's both Blue and Orange Line. Stop. It is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it's a really good look. Honestly, if I was picking a location for them, I would have picked where you live, Atlanta, which I actually think is a better city for them. But um, me too. Uh, I do. No, I actually really seriously think that I, Crystal City is good. I don't think it's great. It's it's, it's going to traffic's going to get bad. There's going to be some issues. But um, you know, I'll put it this way: it was at least you could tell it was thought out well because Crystal City happens to be. Nice, but also in need of a bit of a boost too. It's been declined. Okay. Yeah, it's been declined, no question about it. Um, but and Long Island City, borderline Queens and New York City, you know, Rockettes, Radio City Music Hall. <laughs> so, You'll see yeah. the Rockettes delivering packages at a doorstop near you. Rockettes will be on the drones. <laughs> so, it, it was. It's. It's again. It's. It's a Crystal City like location but more of a city than that so you know on the whole it's uh hold on. it's interesting my phone when that happens actually will say spam question mark <laughs> it does that. no thank you <laughs> <laughs> yes you like they're actually offering you the uh food yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so that's my standpoint what do you think it took 14 months to figure out New York and D.C., really. I mean, it's, you know, I, I'm a little jaded on it. I think uh, I think they got more out of this than just the deals that they ended up with. I think they got a lot of data, a lot of insight into uh, of some of the main 20 biggest cities uh, in, the, in the city, in the, in the country. Um, you know, they they probably figured out how you know maybe we can figure out ways to streamline getting uh, you know our our packages around it better or or you know I I think if they if they probably went into this thinking it was only going to be a handful of cities anyway and they decided oh let's see what what information we may be able to get that these cities want offer up. Um, to see if they if we can come to town, and so I, I just it's for me it's just like okay, fourteen months and we got New York and DC. <laughs> I don't know. Come on, Jeff. <laughs> and, and I think they said is he has a how he has homes in both New York City and DC. Wait, I don't I'll, think he has I'll... one down here. I haven't seen Jeff hanging out at the Stockbridge uh, Kruger Market, so. You know what it tells me? So here's the logic. So got a home in D.C. He owns the Washington Post. Yep. He's now in New York, so he's going to buy the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> Why stop there? Buy the Giants, the Jets. That's right. The Giants, <laughs> I think. Buy the be... Redskins. Uh, you know, I, 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 would, I, I, I would really love that. Just to get rid of Dan Snyder, that would <laughs> be the best thing that could happen to Washington D.C. How, how about how about since he's up in New York, making an offer for a certain team with twenty-seven championships? And I don't think it's time to let it go. Well, I do. I, it would be all right with me. Is that he's on prime holders get ticket? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I could I could do that. I, I could I could definitely live with that. It would, the concession stands would be a lot different. 
Oh my good, yeah. You would you would just have uh, you know five minute delivery to your seat. That's right. You know that if you're actually watching the game on TV at your house, the concession stands will deliver <laughs> to your house. <laughs> no, and then there'll be a whole they'll build a Whole Foods right into that Yankee Stadium. <laughs> That'd be awesome. That would yeah. be awesome. <laughs> Amazon Primo, that's what they'll call it. And you just ask ask let me say I have to turn her off. Ask Alexa for a hot dog and a, a beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. She was a, she. Would, mine went on, but didn't hear. Luckily, what you said. <laughs> well, so maybe I saw the blue line at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> maybe at some point she'll say, uh, "I'll get that for you in five <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Ooh, Alexa-based baseball. Wow. It'll be Alexa. Hit a home run for me. <laughs> what she said. Um, I don't know. She says, <laughs> "I don't know that." You'll have to learn if they buy the if uh, if Jeff Bezos buys the Yankees. Yeah, she didn't hear that part. <laughs> no. All right, well that was fun. I, I I actually the culture stuff was really interesting. Yeah, I think I think it's it's what companies companies have to pay attention to themselves as companies now, not as purveyors of technology. Yeah, our, in our world you have to. They're not just purveyors of technology. They're companies. That have responsibilities as, and also meet customer requirements and desires and needs as companies, not just as the purveyor of products and services. Right. Right. Uh, I have nothing to add to that, so I'm just going to say I'm Brent Leary. I'm Paul Greenberg. We are the CRM players, and maybe we'll do a couple more before the end of the year because, you know. Conference season is over. So. Oh wait, no! Before we, I gotta say one thing. I gotta uh, do uh, this. Uh, oh, this is a nice thing. Uh, I want to shout out to somebody in our industry who never gets shout outs or credit for anything, and that's Lewis Columbus. Right? This is a guy. He's been around forever. Yeah. Right? He's absolutely brilliant. He's one of the nicest people any human being will ever meet on this planet. He's the humblest for sure because no one knows his name outside of the industry at all. I mean, outside of the industry analyst for the most part. But we all read him because everything he says is like a gem. Um, I don't have I, this. Just came to me, so I don't have his data in front of me or where to reach him. And I'm not. I'm sure my keyboard isn't working right. <laughs> so, but look, look. Google Lewis Columbus, L-O-U-I-S Columbus in quotes, and read his stuff. A, he's brilliant. B, he's both a brilliant analyst. He's a brilliant aggregator. He's also one of the nicest people, and he never gets the kudos and mentions he deserves. So I want to shout out to Lewis. And you are incredibly well-respected and loved by a lot of people, whether you believe it or not. (laughs) Yeah, he's he's really... uh somebody who's understated in terms of you know he's he doesn't self-promote he's not out there you know always talking about me 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 and uh that's really cool and refreshing in this day and age i mean (laughs) where it seems like more the more people you know the more people are talking about branding and you know always pointing to themselves as opposed to like you said not only is it great content but he He's just a nice guy. I mean, he he's always been nice to me, and you know that way with it. he's the he's just kind. He's like yeah. fundamentally big hearted and kind, and you know you just don't, you don't run across a combination like him very much. And and he deserves he deserves some public recognition. He just and so I'm starting it right now. I'm in Lewis Columbus bandwagon. Lewis Columbus 2020. He should. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> he should. He should. Uh, we should try to get him at CRM Evolution. That I think of. You know what? Let's get him on the players. Oh yeah, absolutely. Let's get him on the players. He's going to have to talk more though. Right. <laughs> Don't worry, we're good at getting people to do that. <laughs> All right, we will wow. be back hopefully with Lewis Columbus sometime before you know it. See ya. See ya. <laughs>